Now, I was actually going to present on the Internet of Things and privacy, but you know, it's been a long day, and as my dad would say, who happens to be here, those topics are dry as a popcorn fart. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about that. I talk about I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell, tell you a story about a 10-year-old boy. I'm going to tell you a story about a 10-year-old boy at Christmas, because what's better than Christmas? Who doesn't like Christmas? And even when you're an old fogey like me, the granddaddy, you think back and you can remember those few presents that were the best. You know, you got the bike, you got the doll, you got the chemistry set. I just, I just loved my chemistry set. That was good. But it wasn't the best. My best gift for the little 10-year-old budding computer science was a tape recorder. <laughs> now, you might think this is an odd gift, but you know, it's different. A bicycle you ride, the doll you play with, the chemistry set you experiment and learn. But now this bad boy, it comes empty. And you have to fill it up. It's a data collection tool. With it, and if you're going to be a computer scientist later in life, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> we were at Christmas in my grandmother's house in Idaho. And I used this, and I recorded my favorite shows, which, of course, was Hogan's Heroes. Because who, who doesn't like Bob Crane, you know? I taped the little mic to the front of the TV and recorded it, just the audio. And then all the way home from Idaho to North Dakota, in the van, I played that over and over and over again. It probably drove my mom and dad crazy. But, you know, it was awesome, because that data, I collected it, and I owned it, and I could play it whenever I wanted, and if you're a little budding computer scientist, there was nothing better. So now the, the next part of my story, we have to move forward about 40 years. It's last summer, and it's not quite as fun. I was driving down the street in Fargo, and I crashed my pickup. Totaled it. Nobody was hurt. But this was an adventure, because I got to deal with the insurance industry. <laughs> now, the insurance industry is an interesting industry, because of all the industries in the world, the insurance industry is the one that is the most keyed in to predicting the future. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, I suppose in the beginning, insurance companies just sold insurance. And then some people crashed their cars and some didn't. And the people who crashed their cars, the insurance company lost tons of money because they had to pay for the car. And the ones that didn't crash their cars, the insurance companies made lots of money because they just collected the premium and didn't pay anything out. So then, some time ago, I don't know when and where, but some really clever person in the insurance industry said, what if we could foretell the future? What if we could figure out before we sold the insurance policy who was going to crash their car and who wasn't? And I'm sure the guys he worked with or the gals he worked with said, yeah, that'd be awesome, but you know, how are we going to do that? And then probably in one of the greatest privacy breaches ever foisted upon us, somehow, the private insurance company convinced the government to share my driving records with them. That data, the data about my speeding tickets, my stop sign violations, my drunk driving convictions. That data is data that they collect. They collect that data and they do analysis on it and they use that data to predict the future because if you're speeding, drunk driving, or running stop signs, Statistically speaking, you're probably more likely to crash your truck. Now, I wasn't doing any of those things. <laughs> but statistically speaking, if you were, it'd be a bad thing. So, there you go. And that was amazing. Now, this is something called predictive analytics. That's the technical term for this. You collect your data, and then you do analysis on it, and you predict the future. Now, for you uncool people in the audience, that is not a phone booth on my slide. <laughs> Only the cool people know that that is a Doctor Who TARDIS. <laughs> it is a time machine into the future. And this is, of course, it's especially important to insurance, but any industry that can foretell the future, you can make a lot of money if you know which things are going to succeed, which are not. What stocks are going to go up, which stocks are going to go down. But insurance is really important. Okay, you say great, but this is still imperfect because the system at play relies upon a human element. Their data they collect, they only collect data when a, when a cop writes a ticket. Well, you know, there's relatively few policemen relative to the whole population. 
And, you know, frankly speaking, I'm a terrible driver. I speed all the time. And I've never gotten a ticket. <laughs> so somebody, maybe, this, maybe the son of the original person, said, wow, we need to collect more data faster. We can't rely on just only ticket violations coming in. And again, probably all the people working with him said, huh, good luck with that. And guess what? They did it. There's these little things now. All the different insurance companies sell these, or uh, make them available under different names. They're a little device, they're a little dongle. And you plug them in onto your dash. And when you do that, they connect into the computer in your car, and they have access to your speed. And they can upload that 24 by seven, every car that has it, directly into the insurance company's servers. Now, they're collecting 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more data, and they are able to predict more accurately which are the good drivers and which are bad. Now you say, Tim, how do they ever? Clearly, this is a great deal for the insurance companies. How is it a good deal for the consumer? Well, what they do is they agree to share the win-win, and they say, if you're a good driver, we'll lower your rates. If you're not, take it out, we'll put you back the way that you were, all is well. This is the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is powered by data collection and predictive analytics. People collecting data, running analysis, and all the big companies have scores of data scientists working on figuring out how they can analyze your data and use it for their gain and perhaps yours. All right, fine. So this has been a little primer in the first half of my talk on how the Internet of Things works and kind of what drives it, yeah, economically speaking. This is TED, right? We're, we're about ideas. And what, what are the ideas in this presentation and what are the issues that motivate those ideas? Well, there's a few imperfections here. There's a few issues I have. Things that you should know as an educated consumer. The first thing is, is that predictive analytics has some in inaccuracies. It is predictive, it is statistical. I didn't tell you this, but when you plug one of these things in, it doesn't just get your speed. It gets if you brake hard. Because if you're hitting the brakes hard, it means you're probably almost getting in a wreck. It also can detect when you are driving in various uh, implementations. And statistically speaking, if you are driving around 1 a.m., Statistically speaking, you are probably part of the bar crowd. And I think on a statistical basis, that is probably an accurate assumption. If you are a nurse who is driving to the night shift at 1 a.m., they can't tell that. If you give your car to the valet to park, and he does a little Ferris Bueller moment and hits the brakes hard a few times, they can't tell that. Now, I'm not here to impugn the insurance company. This is a capitalistic world. They make an offer. Many people who are good drivers could benefit from this, but I just want to make you aware that there are inaccuracies. This is all statistical based. The second issue I want to talk about and make you aware of is that privacy always comes at a cost. Anytime I word the use, the use the word always, I worry a little bit, but I think that's a pretty uh, safe assumption. Now, what do I mean by that? They say, if you plug this in, you might save money, and if you don't, you send it back and they put you back where you were, no harm. And that is true in the near, ter near term, like all good marketing, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Because if you think it through, insurance is about the risk pool. And if over time, the group of people who are willing to sacrifice their privacy and are, who good, and are good drivers will move into another pool with lower rates, what's that gonna do to the existing pool, which consists of bad drivers, and maybe people like me who value their privacy. It's gonna get consistently um, strengthened with more and more bad drivers. And the rates on that pool are going to go up because I'm lumped in with the bad drivers because I won't sacrifice my privacy. So privacy comes at a cost. The last issue on to bring up is the complexity of this. I mean, this sounds like a pretty good offer, and for many people it is, but the thinking process of thinking through the will rates really go up over time, what are the risk pools, what are, you know, are they analyzing hard stops, time of day, I mean, it takes a lot of time to figure this out. And yeah, they make available privacy policies that you can go grovel through, 
but it's very complex. And the Internet of Things is going to make these kind of devices more and more common. They're going to start every part of your life, they're going to start appearing. And if it's always this complex to make a choice and a decision, we're going to have a problem as a society. So, you know, here's the idea. We've dealt with cases in society where society makes to, needs to make complex choices on a regular basis. For example, nutrition. The FDA came up with the food pyramid. Another example is movie ratings. Came up with G, P, G, and R. I think we need something like this for privacy. Now, of course, you're going to say, this is way too complex to be you know, just one symbol. And I point out to you that the movie rating system is not complete upon to itself. But what it does mean, if I see a G movie or a PG movie, I don't have to think about it. I know my kids can go. If I see an R movie, it doesn't really tell me enough about my high school students, whether they should go or not, but it, tell, it does tell me I need to do further research. I need to look at reviews, I need to find people who have gone there, I need to invest time. And I would propose something similar for privacy. For example, something very simple, I call it the hands-off policy. Now maybe you have a Fitbit, and, or an activity tracker, and it uploads your data, and then it needs to store it so then your phone you can see it over time. But that data is a black box. Fitbit never looks at it, they never touch it, their hands are off. That is good privacy. They could have the hands off sticker. <laughs> if you're in this sort of situation, where the company is going to analyze your data, which may be a win-win for you, you don't get the hands-off sticker. You get the predictive analysis, uh, analysis at play sticker. And then that's not good or bad. It just tells you you need to do more research. I think that we need to do something like this as a society to help deal with that first line of education so that people know when they need to do more research on a topic. Thank you.